Hope you all enjoyed that. That was a little four bar loop that I wrote to showcase this massive MIDI machine here. It's got an octave of range, a player head so that you can see where you are in the measure, six subdivisions per beat, percussion underneath, support for two different tempos, and it's incredibly impractical. Now this is a story all about how I thought this would be a quick and simple project, but it ended up taking me over a month. <sighs> Let's talk about that. So let's start with the simple part of this whole thing, which is actually the redstone, believe it or not. No, 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 don't leave, don't leave. I promise, it's actually really quite simple. Before I even started designing the physical look of this thing, I knew a couple of basic things that I wanted. I knew I wanted the machine to be horizontal, flat, instead of a vertical wall. I also knew that I wanted redstone lamps with levers on them so that I can, you know, turn the notes on and off. And I also knew that I wanted them to be spaced one block apart in this kind of grid formation. The idea is that each of these redstone lamps will have its own note block right underneath it, and each row will be tuned to the same note. So say for instance this is on that keyboard over there, this line could be C for instance, and then this line could be C sharp, and this line could be D, and they will have a set amount of delay between them. And then a redstone pulse will be fed into all three of them at the same time, and then all of them will attempt to play. So the basic principle is that the machine will attempt to play every single note block in this grid, and if they're enabled, then you'll hear its sound, and if it's disabled, then you won't hear its sound. I was also thinking at the beginning that I might be able to do a fully adjustable tempo, but that turned out to be completely impractical more on that later. But for now, this was the footprint that I wanted to follow for the user interface, which is a grid of redstone lamps with one block in between them. Now I just needed to figure out how to enable and disable note blocks at will. So there's a couple different ways that you can disable a note block. One is by constantly powering them, as you can see, as I push this button it doesn't continue to make noise, and the other is by pushing or placing a block directly above it. As you can see, no noise comes out here either. Of course, the powering option does make it play one time before finally locking up, so I think we know which one is better for our needs. So the obvious way to place a block over a note block is with a piston, as you can see here, and that's what I was originally thinking of doing before I remembered this magical little block right here. Powdered Snow, aka the only block in the game that can be placed and removed with a dispenser. Thanks Mojang. So back up top, we need the dispensers to fire every single time that this lever is flicked, right? Whether it's on or off. And the best way to do that is to have an observer simply looking at this lamp. That way it'll send a quick pulse every single time this lever is flicked, right? So this turns on, it sends a pulse, it turns off, it sends a pulse. And then right below, we're gonna have two dispensers here. Now the reason we're using two of them is because we have two different tempos. One of these for the slow tempo and one of these for the fast tempo. And then each of these, a powdered snow, and then a redstone dot on top of that. And as you can see, every single time that this lever is flicked, both of those dispensers fire. What happened here? Did I miss? I, I missed. Okay, interesting. I missed. Guess I'm not that good with the mouse. But yeah, as you can see there, they both fire every single time that this lever is flicked up top. Now a little added benefit with this little setup here is that the redstone lamp has a pretty slow response time, which makes this pretty spam proof as you can see. But you can definitely still break it if you put your mind to it. Let's see if I can... Yeah, that looks about broken, I think. Yeah. So then, naturally, the note blocks go here, right below these two snow blocks, with their instrument blocks right below it. And there you go, that's your module. So over here at the final design, we essentially have a flipped version of this, but it's basically the same thing. 
and you see two different repeater lines. The first one here that you can see is on two ticks each. That represents our slow tempo, and our fast tempo is one tick each. And if we go into spectator mode, you can actually see that each of these is one tick, and that's going right in between, threading the needle between these two slices. From here, it was just verifying that this is a tileable design, meaning that you can place them touching side by side without them interfering with each other. And there you have it. Then all you have to do is just hook up a clock that's exactly as long as your loop, and then route the output to each of these and make sure that they are on the same delay, and then you're done. So here's the view from the bottom of the finished design, and from here you can see that it looks really dense and very impressive, but in reality, I mean, as I just showed you, this is nothing more than a grid of an observer powering two dispensers all put side by side and yeah that's that's literally that's it and then there's the player head which keeps track of which beat you're on which is admittedly more complicated than the grid itself but is still not that complicated all it does is just taps into the grid to get its on and off timings now the reason that there's all this spaghetti redstone and interconnected and all the comparators and all this stuff is because I wanted the player head to be as precise as possible. And by that I mean, I wanted the lights to be on for the exact duration of the beat before moving on to the next one, and I also wanted no overlap between the lights. So when this light is on, this light is off. And as soon as this light turns on, this one turns off, and so on. And I needed it to be very precise to the beat and work with both tempos. So yeah, that's what all this is about. All in all, the player head is a bit over-engineered for what it does, but it works well, so that's good enough for me. Now it was time to think about the physical design of this thing. Well, obviously, I thought I wanted to harness the full power of the note block with this contraption. I mean, it is a MIDI machine, after all. So I wanted it to look like the MIDI piano interface in your DAW, or digital audio workstation, with the piano keys on the left, the beat marker on the top, and the workspace for the rest of it. So the way the workspace works is that the left and right position of your note dictates when it will play in the measure, and then how far it is up and down corresponds to which note it will be playing. So for example, this first note here, hits on beat three, as you can see from the top there, and its note is a B1, because it's lined up with the B1 note on the piano. In addition to that, I thought it would be pretty cool to add a little percussion section that lives right below the main workspace. So I got to work, and this is what I came up with, and oh my god, it's huge. So huge, in fact, that hovering over the middle of it so that you can see the whole thing, I noticed that I could barely hear the highest notes playing at the beginning and end of the measure. There was also a really significant difference between the volume of the notes closest to the player versus the notes that are far away from the player. You see, note blocks have a range of two octaves, F sharp on both ends, for a total of 25 notes. And since they're spaced out two blocks apart, that's 50 blocks from end to end. You can hear a note block from 48 blocks away, but from that far they're really really quiet. Then as I increase the subdivisions from 8th notes to 16th notes and beyond, things just got so much worse. So I had to make the decision to chop my range in half to just one octave. I know, I know, I limited the note block even more, but I had to do it. But since I'm at one octave, I had to choose one, so I decided to choose C to C, since that's the simplest. So at this point, I had my design and my functionality, so I just had to decide on what tempo I should shoot for. At this point, I was dead set on subdividing my measures into 16th notes, since that gives me enough to play with. So the delay between the notes would dictate my tempo. And this is where I hit my first snag. 
My favorite tempo is around 120, since that feels natural and upbeat to me, so of course I tried to find out what redstone delay would give me that tempo at 16th notes. So I started with one tick. 150 BPM. Too fast. Oh, okay, how about two ticks? Oh, 75. That's way too slow. It dawned on me very quickly that this is a problem. You see, one redstone tick is one tenth of a second, which is pretty quick, unless you're dividing each beat into four. Now with each additional tick, I'm slowing down the beat by almost half a second per beat and over one and a half seconds per measure. That's the difference between a fast techno beat and a smooth romantic R&B track. And since one redstone tick is the smallest quanta of delay available, without some game tick shenanigans, I was stuck there. I considered writing a loop at 150 BPM, but that felt too rushed. I also considered writing one at 75 BPM, but that felt too sluggish. Was there really no way to get a tempo in between? I mean, I swear I've seen covers with a different tempo before. So I searched online for note block covers and found this video on Reddit. So first off, really cool video, right? But yeah, this is definitely between 75 and 150. So what's going on here? Well, I found out that there's six ticks in every beat here, meaning that it's at a much more comfortable 100 BPM. Then it hit me. I've been so tunnel visioned on subdividing my measures into 16s that I hadn't even considered any other subdivisions. Here, with six ticks per beat, that's perfectly set up for sextuplet subdivisions, which is just as valid as the 16ths that I wanted to do originally, and it gives me more notes per beat to play around with, with 6 per beat instead of just 4. Of course, using sextuplets instead of 16ths is going to sound different, with the sextuplets having a more swung feel, but that's perfectly fine by me. All right, so let's make it six tuplets and wow. Yeah, two octaves would be out of the question at this point. There's no way I'm hearing those notes. But yeah, looking good. So that means that there's only one step left. And that's... Yep, that's me. Humming a melody that I'd come up with right before plopping into bed. Don't judge the tone. Okay, I, I was tired. So this was recorded on September 29th. So what on earth took me another three weeks to write this loop? Well, one of those weeks was a vacation, but more importantly, I'm a self-taught beginner who's also a perfectionist. And what happens when you combine those two things? Time. A lot of time. I started with the melody, firing up MuseScore and transcribing what I sang into my phone. Once I was done, I noticed it was in a minor key. Huh. Okay. So I transposed that to F, since that's right between C and C, and now we're in F minor. The next week and a half of on and off writing were a lot of trial and error, looking things up, and procrastination. I was also feeling the pain of having kneecapped my contraption by limiting it to only one octave. But one by one, I filled out the bass line, chord progression, counter melody, and drums until I was satisfied. Then I put that in the game, recorded it, did some post-processing to balance the sound, and the result is what you heard at the beginning of this video. So I hope you liked it. All that said though, this contraption really does leave a lot to be desired. The two things that I believe hurt it most are the small one octave range and the poor listening experience. I mean, to even get a decent listening experience, I had to hook up command blocks that teleport you right above each measure as they play. Ideally, you want to be able to listen to what you wrote while standing still, but that's just impossible with it being in this form. But this does have my gears turning, and I'll be working on another version of this machine that will hopefully address these issues, so subscribe if you want to see a follow-up on this thing. 
But for now, this is what we have in all of its janky glory. I hope you enjoyed this showcase, and thanks for coming along the journey of its creation with me. If you liked it, I would really appreciate it if you would drop a like on this video, and subscribe for more redstone creations and tutorials. See you all in the next one. Bye-bye.